if you are a regular to my channel, you will know I have been in the plumbing and gas industry for about 42 years. And out of those 42 years, I've been teaching plumbing and gas for about 23 or 24 of those years. And if you are a regular to this channel, you will know I am going over to the dark side to train to be an air source heat pump engineer. So I'm finding out if you can teach an old dog new tricks. Now, Tomcat have teamed up with Hybrid Technical Services to bring the heat pump course or training to be an air source heat pump engineer for absolutely free. So if you've been following the videos on Sundays, you'll know what I've been up to. But if you haven't been following those videos on Sunday and you want to do the air source heat pump course for free, absolutely zilch for nothing, then why don't you drop us an email at info at tom-cat.co.uk and Catherine will get back to you and tell you what your next steps are. Now you are only allowed to come and do this course if you are a qualified plumber or you're a gas engineer or you're a heating and vent engineer. That is the stipulation to be able to get onto this course and do it for absolutely free. Now I'm going to keep my gas prejudice away from this course because I want to find out exactly if air source heat pumps do what they say on the tin. And I am going to be going out with my son Tom, who is an eco-engineer, to see exactly how we're going to install these uh, air source heat pumps. And then, at the end of my training, and at the end of when I've installed these air source heat pumps, I'm going to make a decision on whether I think they are going to be the future or whether the government is just telling us porky pies about them. Now I'm on week five of going over to the dark side and training to be an air source heat pump engineer but what I thought I would do is I would let you know what I've actually learned as I'm on the journey. Now I thought the first thing I'd do is start by showing you how heat pumps work. So let's get on with it and find out exactly how an air to water heat pump actually works. Now there are four types of uh, heat pumps in the world. There is air to air. An air to air heat pump is a heating and cooling system that takes heat from outside air and transfers it to the interior of the home. The average installation of an air to air heat pump costs around 5,000 to 10,000. Its average running cost is about 1,360 pounds a year, but it could reduce your heating bill between 20 and 40%. There is air to water. An air to water source heat pump transfers heat from the outside air to water which heats your home via radiators or underfall heating. It can also heat water stored in hot water cylinders for your hot tap, showers and bath. Switching to an air source heat pump can reduce your annual fuel bill by as much as £780 if you have an LPG, coal or an electric heating system. There is ground source and there is water source heat pumps. A ground source heat pump is a renewable heating system that extracts low temperature solar energy stored in the ground or water using buried pipework and compresses this energy into higher temperature. A ground source heat pump provides a building with 100% of its heating and hot water needs all year round. A water source heat pump works by extracting heat from a body of water, converting it into useful energy to heat the home. Like the ground source heat pump, they use a series of submerged pipes containing a working fluid to absorb the heat from a river, lake, large pond or the borehole. Now, let's take a look at this air to water heat pump. Now, this part of the drawing, and I'm sorry about the crudity of the drawing, it's the best I could do at the time. Um, this is what you would find inside that big box, what goes in your garden. So the first thing you would see or hear or feel will be the fan blowing across a heat exchanger. And this is that heat exchanger. The air comes from the back and is blown out to the front. And this is called the evaporator. 
The evaporator is a low temperature heat exchanger where the refrigerant enters as a low temperature liquid, absorbs the heat from the air by evaporation at low pressure and then leaves as a higher temperature vapour. Now, it is able to absorb this heat in this refrigerant because the refrigerant has a very low boiling point which is about minus 48 and a half degrees. So basically what that means is, even up to temperatures as low as minus 15 outside, because these units are outside, remember, the heat pump can still take heat out of the air, which is pretty amazing, really. So basically what this is, is a reverse refrigerator. Because if you think of a fridge, what that does is, it takes the heat out of the food inside that well insulated box and then transfers that heat on the outside of the fridge by that big set of fins at the back. Well this does the opposite. It takes the heat from the air and transfers that into water when we get to the end of it. Now the reason why we can't use water inside here is because water has a boiling point of a hundred degrees centigrade, which is basically no good. It wouldn't be able to draw any heat out quickly from the air. So that's why we use this refrigerant. Now at the moment, I believe we are using R410A refrigerant in our air source heat pumps, which is supposed to be better for the environment than the old refrigerant which was called Freon I think. So this is like very ozone friendly I believe. So now once it leaves the evaporator and it's slightly warmer than when it's come back it goes into a compressor. In the compressor, the low pressure of the low temperature refrigerant vapour from the evaporator is raised to the pressure that is significantly higher to match desired condensing temperature in the condenser. During compression, not only the pressure, but also the temperature of the refrigerant will increase. Now, this refrigerant vapour, which has now been pressurised and the temperature increased, because obviously if you squash them thin you will increase the pressure because of the molecules. Now this vapour is now as low as 25 degrees centigrade but could be up to 75 degrees centigrade. It then passes to a plate to plate heat exchanger which is called the condenser. The condenser is a high temperature heat exchanger where the refrigerant enters as a high temperature vapour, rejects heat to the heat sink which is the central heating water by condensation at high pressure and leaves as a high temperature liquid again. Now this heat has been transferred into this central heating water which can go off now and feed a cylinder or your radiators or underfloor heating. It's now on its journey back to the beginning again to start all over again. But before it gets back here to the evaporator it needs to go through a few little devices. Now the first one it comes back, now remember this is a high pressure cooler liquid again, it needs to go through a filter dryer. Filter dryers are usually installed in a liquid line of a dry expansion refrigerant system where they have a dual function. First, they trap coarse particles, contamination and copper shavings and second, they capture any moisture present in the system. The filter dryer should be replaced each time the refrigerant system is opened. Now it's passed through that filter dryer, its next component it reaches is the side glass. Sight glass is normally installed in the liquid line directly after the filter dryer in the system with an expansion valve after it. The sight glass can be installed anywhere along the pipe run in the liquid line, however positioning close to the expansion valve is always advisable. Now generally speaking, a standard sight glass with an indicator also has a dual function. It monitors whether the moisture content of the refrigerant is within acceptable range and it indicates whether liquid refrigerant is always present at the expansion component. If the moisture content is okay, the indicator color is green 
and no further action is necessary. Now it's nearly got back to the evaporator, but first of all, it needs to go through this expansion valve. On its return to the evaporator from the condenser, the high temperature, high pressure liquid refrigerant must change to a low temperature, low pressure liquid that enters the evaporator. This is usually achieved by throttling device known as the expansion valve. When the hot liquid passes through this valve, not only will the pressure be reduced, but at the same time, the temperature will drop. As the pressure drops, refrigerant starts to evaporate in the valve and the heat of the evaporation is taken from the refrigerant itself which causes its temperature to drop as the result is a low temperature low pressure mix of liquid and vapor and now finally it's gone through the expansion valve and it goes back to the evaporator where it starts all over again so that's how an air to water heat pump works and that's what I learned on day four of going over to the dark side and becoming an air source heat pump engineer. Now, don't forget, if you want to take advantage of this government-backed free, and I mean absolutely free course, don't forget, drop us an email at info at tom-cat.co.uk and Catherine will sort you out. Anyway, hopefully you've liked the video and I'll catch you on the next one. Cheers.